Okay, nice to see everyone this evening. Let's begin our service in a word of prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come into your house this evening, Lord. We anticipate a blessing. We pray that your precious Holy Spirit might be amongst us tonight, that we had indeed might listen, we might learn from the pages of your holy word. I ask you to empower our pastor and open our hearts to the message that he has prepared for us, Lord. Now bless the singing as we go forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to hymn number 174, Under His Wings, 174. Under His wings I am safely abiding, though the night deepens and tempests are wild still i can trust him i know he will keep me he has redeemed me and i am his child under his wings under his wings whom from his love can sever My soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Under his wings, what a refuge in sorrow. How the heart yearningly turns to his rest. Often when heart has no room for my earning, there I find comfort and there I find blessed. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his wings my soul shall abide, safely abide Under his wings, oh, what precious enjoyment. There will I hide till life's trial are o'er. Sheltered, protected, no evil can harm me. Resting in Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his wings my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Beautiful song, beautiful thought, comforted. Okay, in terms of announcements, they're pretty basic. Tuesday morning at 8.30, men will meet here for a time of prayer and fellowship. If you have a chance as a voluntary, come out if you can. Wednesday night, of course, we have the 7 o'clock prayer meeting service as well as the youth group meeting downstairs. Mommy and Me continues to meet on Thursday mornings at 10 o'clock a.m. The Sunday services are pretty much the same, starting at 10 o'clock in the morning with Sunday school. And we have the morning worship immediately following. And of course, the choir practice is at 5. And in the 6 o'clock evening services, you attest to your knowledge of that by being here tonight. Thank you. Ladies and girls, tea will be on February the 17th at 10 o'clock a.m. The theme is Good Deed Doers. That's a good theme to have. Refreshments provided. See the shine-up sheet for details. Uh, men's prayer breakfast will be the second Tuesday, our second Saturday of the month, I believe that's 10th of February, so that's at 8.30 as well. Uh, youth pre-Super Bowl party, that's February 10th, coming up very soon, 6 o'clock p.m. at the church. Bring a snack to share and enjoy a good time. Again, there is a sign-up sheet for that as well. We'll kind of have an idea of who's coming. Anyone using offering, envelope, offering envelopes should continue to use the leftover lip envelopes from 2023 if you were in need of more envelopes see see brother jeff blackburn he can fix you up in that uh, still needing volunteers for the cleaning if you're interested in that let someone know keep in mind uh amelia had a baby boy ezekiel is in there. that's a good name ezekiel 
I hope they don't break it down to Zeke, but the, I'm sure they will at some point in life. They'll do that. Two pounds, eight ounces, a big strapping young man. That's what I like to see. Uh, that's a good thought, and I'm, I'm grateful that she's come through it, and her and Dylan must be just kind of floating on air, and that's a blessing. May the Lord continue to raise that little one up, make him stronger, get him home soon. We can turn over to hymn number 66, Praise Ye the Triune God, a song that we haven't sang here. I've sang the song. It's been many millennia, <laughs> not quite millennia, but it's been a long time. So I'm going to ask the ladies if they'll be so kind as to play this through slowly. We'll try to get it. It's a good, good song. It takes, it takes all three parts of our Godhead. Nothing to it. We can do it. We'll just do the best we can for the glory of the Lord, and he'll bless it all together. Praise ye the Father for his loving kindness. Tenderly cares he for his erring children. Praise him, ye angels, praise him in the heavens, praise ye Jehovah, praise ye the Savior. A lot of theology in that song, but it is a wonder to have a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're never alone. Wait a minute. Well, good evening. You could turn with me again this evening to Genesis chapter 6, and we're going to continue uh, where we left off this morning and thinking about the reputation that Noah had. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9 says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Let's uh, pray, and then we'll get into the Word tonight. Lord, we thank you for this day that we've been able to set aside a day for gathering and worshiping. Lord, a day for looking into your Word together, serving together. Father, I pray that it would have been in uh, some way a day of rest. And Lord, we pray that as we continue to think about Noah and the example that he served for us, uh, that we would consider what lessons we can learn and apply to our own lives. This we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 
So I was reading about a baseball player this afternoon, and I probably won't say his name right. Um, I even made a little notation down on how to say his name, but Joe Garagiola, is that right? Yeah. Haji Nasachi, okay. And I was reading something that he said about himself. He says, each year I don't play, I get better. He says, the first year on the banquet trail, I was a former ball player. The second year, I was great. The third year, one of baseball's stars. And just last year, I was introduced as one of baseball's immortals. The older I get, the more I realize that the worst break I had was playing. <laughs> and so as it goes quite often in, in those kind of circles, you know, they kept heaping on more and more praise. And kind of the further he got from his actual baseball career, the more they kind of heaped praise upon him. Uh, his reputation uh, was improving the older he got and the further he got from actually playing the game. His stats didn't change. The facts didn't change. But in a positive sense, people's perspective of him just kind of grew, kind of like the, the fabled big fish story. And every time the story gets told, the fish gets bigger. And this is kind of an example of, of a positive change that as he was more and more liked and kind of had this increase in status in the eyes of people, um, his reputation kind of got bigger and bigger. And it can just as so easily go the other way, that if someone, you know, isn't liked or if something happens, then their reputation, you know, diminishes. And it's, again, not that the facts change, but people's perception does. And so what I want us to think about is, is as we continue to think about nowhere and the reputation he had, and we think about how we're known and we are known of God and known by others, that what ultimately matters the most is what God thinks of us. And we want to make sure we have a good reputation. You know, one of the um, qualifications of a pastor, of an elder, is that they have a good testimony of those that are outside of the church as well as those that are inside. And it's not about, again, having this, you know, perfect uh, reputation, but there's no, uh, there's nothing that is contrary to the character that they ought to have a good character, a person of good standing. So we want to have that, but we don't want to become slaves to what other people expect of us and what the world says we ought to be because it can go in many different directions. Ultimately, what does God know of us? And as we stand for the Lord and as we serve the Lord and as we go through life walking with him and trying to emulate Noah in that way that we could be considered ones who walk with God, that if that gives us a good reputation with those who are outside of the church, then we praise the Lord. If it puts us into conflict with them, well, then we don't uh, compromise. We don't do anything differently in order to please them. We just keep walking with the Lord. And so uh, we considered this morning whether or not we were known by the enemy. We kind of looked at it in a different perspective. Does the enemy see us as one who is serving on the front lines uh, and doing something for the Lord? But this evening, we do want to think about this question. Are we known by God? Uh, the story being told here is the story that God relates, that he inspires this record of Noah, a just man, perfect in his generations, and one who walked with God. And so this evening, as we think about that question, are you known by God? We're going to answer it in a couple of ways. Uh, God, again, knew Noah. He knew that he was a man who needed grace, but he knew he was a man who by faith had received the grace that was being offered to him. And the simple fact of the matter is that God does know us. But the question is going to come down to whether or not he knows us as one of his children, and that we can be a recipient of his blessings, or whether he knows us to be a rebel, and we are going to be a recipient of judgment. So are you known by God? And the first thing we need to reconcile in our minds, and something that I know all of us here have heard before and should be uh, absolutely uh, comfortable with, is that God knows our sin. All have sinned, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's no exceptions to that. Uh, there are no exclusions. There's no getting away from it. All have sinned. And God, we know, doesn't overlook our sin, but he made a way to deal with it. And I want to uh, just spend a little bit of time looking at Romans 3, 24 uh, through 26. It 
because it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then it it tells us how what God has done, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God, God has set forth Jesus to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So God knows our sin, but the comforting, wonderful message of the gospel is that God has made a way not to overlook our sins and say, well, I'm just going to ignore that and let it slide. But God looks at our sin and he made a way in Jesus Christ to be both just and the justifier. A way that we could be forgiven, and yet he would remain consistent with his own character. And he did that through sending his son, Jesus Christ. And so that's something that I know everyone here has heard repeatedly, and we should be very comfortable with. Uh, But an aspect of it I want to draw your attention to this evening is the relief that can be found when a person stops running from God. You know, now, you may go through a time when you sin and you think, well, you, you don't consciously have the thought, well, I'm getting away with it. And, you know, God didn't see that. If we stopped, we'd have to admit, well, I, God knows what I've done. He knows all things. But there's a relief that comes when we stop and we say, you know what? The Lord knows. The Lord sees everything and, and he, he knows everything I speak and he knows everything I don't speak, but that crosses my mind. He knows it all. And when we stop and admit that, there should be uh, a relief that comes across us because we stop running from God. If you think about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, and he gets his own way, he wants his inheritance, and he goes away into a far country, and he lives riotously, and he lives the party life, and he does everything that he's ever wanted to do. But it leaves him living among the pigs, literally uh, trying to get the scraps that the pigs would refuse. And he finds himself there, and he's miserable. He's got everything he's ever wanted, and he's never been so unhappy. But the turning point for him came not the further he got from his father, but the point where he stopped and he says, I'm going to go back to my father. And when he got back to his father, the father received him. Uh, He was expecting to go back and hoping maybe just to be received back as a servant. And he could just live among the servants in his father's household. And yet the father welcomes him back and celebrates his return and blesses him. And he gets something he could never have anticipated. So long as we run from the Lord, so long as we don't acknowledge our sin, and this is true of the one who is as of yet without Christ, and it's true of the saint who knows the Lord, and and they're running and kind of just trying to get away from their guilty conscience and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the point where you stop and you say, the Lord knows I'm a sinner, and I need to go back to him, I need to put this right, there's a relief that comes from that. God knows our sin. Don't try and hide it. Don't try and get away with it. Don't try and continue in it. Don't try and, you know, think that somehow if you keep going in your sin long enough that, you know, God's just going to let it pass. There's always consequences for it. And, you know, not least of all would be our own consciences. Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. The wicked who have a guilty conscience are going to be, maybe in a literal sense, but definitely in a figurative sense, they're going to be jumpy. I know there have been times when, uh, you know, when I was growing up, we lived, uh, the church where I went to was in Brimpton, and um, there was nothing really around us for a couple of miles, and it was a tiny village, so even the nearest house, there wasn't exactly a lot of light and so once you got away from the, the church building, the old stone building that was there, and you kind of walked out to the field a little bit, it would get darker and darker. And before you got too far, it would be pitch black, and you could see just nothing at all. And as, you know, young people, we would stand in a line and walk further and further into the darkness until someone got jumpy and ran back. And then everybody kind of got a little bit spooked, and they'd all run away. As we got older, we would kind of go for longer walks after church into the countryside. And I remember a number of times we'd be walking through a field and then somebody would hear something and everybody would get spooked. And then we would, you know, see that there was a cow just munching away in the distance. But, you know, in our imaginations that had grown into some terrible monster. 
And really, cows are. I mean, you know the statistic, more people are called by cows every year, killed by cows every year than sharks. So, you know, cows are killers. You have to watch out for them. So, <laughs> you've got to watch out for the cows. It's not a warning I give often. But you know you get spooked sometimes. Uh, and I know when I've been here, and it, it definitely initially when you know I was here, and for some of the first times when buildings just have their own noises, the heating comes on, and there's clicks and pops and all kinds of things going on, and you're kind of sat there thinking, am I in the building alone, or is there someone here? And as soon as your mind starts going that way, it can be really difficult to stop thinking like that. And I told you what Lynn Carnes did to me, you know, we... Uh, Miss Lynn, just a you know, precious saint with the Lord now. But I remember, you know, when I was just here during this, you know, the, the weeks when we were closed during the initial kind of COVID uh, era there that I would have the service here on my own. And she said to me once, uh, you know, remember we had the big curtains up there. And she said, do you ever get nervous that somebody's behind the curtains? And I said, no, but I will now. And so every time that I came here after that, for those few times afterwards, I would like come in, get things set up, and then I would duck behind there and have a look in the baptistry, make sure nobody was going to jump out and get me. Because she'd sowed that seed in my mind. And you know, the guilty who have sin that hasn't been reconciled, sin that hasn't been dealt with, it says the wicked flee when no man pursueth because their consciences are going uh, at them and they can't escape it until they deal with it. And so when we think about being known by God, there's a moment of relief when we say, you know what, God knows I've sinned. And when we make that choice to go back to him and whether we repent and accept him as our savior or we confess our sin and, and we ask him to forgive us and that fellowship is reconciled, that is a good thing. That is a blessing to have that taken care of. So are we known by God? Yes, he knows our sin. And as we come to know him as our savior, we have the added blessings of knowing that he knows us in a positive sense. I want us to look at a few verses. We're going to move between them pretty quickly here. But Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1 is speaking about Israel. And I know it directly applies to them. But we're going to see how it continues on to speak about believers as well. But you see the heart of God. In Isaiah 43 and verse 1, it says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee. Have you ever considered how much people rob themselves of when they deny that God made them. And they remove from themselves that really among the, the, the first blessings that we have of God that he made us. God said to Israel, Now saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. You know, Israel was in a state of sin. Isaiah was bringing a message of present judgment and then future deliverance. And within this chapter, there are these moments, within this book, there are these moments of the compassion of the Lord. And God tells Isaiah to tell Israel, I created you. I formed you. I have called you. I know you by your name. You are mine. It goes on to say in verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. God said to Israel, I know you. I've called you by your name. And I think we can look at that in a couple of ways. God knows us by name, but he'd also given them a name. He had changed the name of Jacob to Israel, and he had given Israel that name. He gave them names of, of, of affection. Let's go over to the New Testament. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. 
It says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knows them that are his. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. There is a context here of, of, of service and of those who are heir. He talks about those in verse 17. But just think about that phrase for a moment. The Lord knows them that are his. The Lord knows those that belong to him. The Lord knows you. In Galatians 4 verse 9, we won't go there, but Paul brings out, he says, you are known of God. You know God, but he says, first of all, and more importantly, you are known of God. The Lord knows that are his, those that are his. People crave fame, don't they? People crave fame. And I remember 15, 20 years ago when kind of the social media era was unfolding and you had the early days of videos and, you know, short clips and things. And, you know, they talked about the fact that with the Internet, everyone eventually is going to get their five minutes of fame. And some people got it, whether they liked it or not. And, you know, some people pursue it and they just want to be known. They want to be famous, and it's sometimes sad to see the extremes that they'll go to in order to get some kind of recognition. And it says something about the need of their own heart or of their own personality that, you know, there's something so lacking that they'll go to extreme measures just to be known. And some people have done extreme things in order to get a, a viral video out there, and they've died in the process. Or they have left themselves with a reputation that they can't get away with and they can't get away from. But what a blessing. What, what comfort there comes from being able to stand back and say, the Lord knows them that are his. The Lord knows me. I am known of God. And when we prioritize that, why would we seek anything else? Why would we chase anything else or you know let some kind of imagined or some kind of taught need someone saying to us look if you you've got to be famous you want to be popular you want to get out there and people say good things about you and well no if you're known of God then we can just be content with that we can be satisfied with that if we go to first Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 3 Paul says, if any man loves God, the same is known of him. Paul here is saying that one of the evidences of being known by God is that we love God. And I think that ties in with 1 John 4, where it says that God, you know, that love is of God. And any man that loveth is, you know, loved of God and loves God. And there's a kind of circular argument that he goes around there in 1 John chapter 4. But when God loves us and we've received him as our savior, we love him. And that's one of those evidences of that we know God. If any man love God, the same is known of him. And we just keep coming back to this idea that God knows you. Psalm 139, uh, in those opening four verses, talks about the fact that, you know, God knows me. When I rise up and when I lie down, when I go about my daily life, God knows. He is all-knowing all-powerful, and that ought not to make us afraid or, or to have any kind of negative connotation. It should motivate us to want to live in, in a way that is pleasing to Him, but it ought to comfort us. God knows us. God sees. God understands. When we think about Jesus being the good shepherd in John chapter 10 and verse 14, in John 10, in numerous ways, it talks about Jesus being the, the good shepherd. But I just want to read that single verse. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. He knows and he cares. That word to, to know them has this idea of, of knowing them that are his. He says, I know their hearts, I know their wishes, their purposes, their circumstances. God, Jesus said, they're my sheep and I know them. I understand them. I know their heartaches and their questions. I know their sorrows. And again, this is something that should draw us to him. When we, you know, if we're going through a time of disobedience and we stop and we say, I know I've sinned and I need to go back to the Lord. There's that time of 
just kind of relief of saying, you know what, God does know, and I'm going to, by His grace and, and through Jesus, make things right. Well, if you're ever struggling with discouragement or doubts or whatever it may be, desires that you want to see fulfilled, and they're just kind of stirring around inside of you, there's a blessing and a calm, I believe, that comes when we turn around and say, well, the Lord knows, and we speak to Him about it, and we go to Him in prayer, and we just spend time with Him. Psalm 147 and verse 4 is one of those verses I just love where it says that God, uh, he knows all the stars, he's created them all. He says he calls them by their name. He has a name for all the stars. One of my first realizations that John knows stuff is when I, you know, almost exactly five years ago now when we first came here, um, I threw out the statistic about how many stars they estimate exist and how many estimated hundreds of, you know, billions of galaxies there are and each galaxy has this many hundreds of thousands of stars. And, you know, I said, I don't know what that number is. Does anybody? And John did, you know, and he did the math. And that was one of those first times I kind of realized that John knows stuff. But, you know, God looks at all of those stars that we have to estimate because there's too many for us to count. And it says he knows them by their names. So if God has that ability for these inanimate objects, these numerous, you know, lights that are in outer space there, then how much greater do you think he knows you and I? He made us a little lower than the angels, but he made us distinct from the angels in that we can be redeemed. The angels can't. He's called for us to serve him in a way that the angels cannot. And if God knows all this, God knows when a sparrow falls. I was amazed this week when one of the little security cameras I have at the house caught, uh, I think it was a bluebird, just kind of popped up on the camera, posed, and then flew away again. And I caught one. But how many millions of those every day are just going about their life? And God knows. With the advent of, you know, everybody having a camera and every ta- everybody taking a video. There was a video I saw a while back and, you know, there's this lady there getting ready to shoot a video and she sat there with a dog or a cat, I don't remember which, and she's getting ready to say something and this bird just falls out of the sky dead in front of her. And she was somewhat upset. And how many times a day does it see? That was my reaction. I was like, well, that's hilarious. <laughs> and the girl was all upset. And the dog or the cat or whatever it was just didn't care either way. But God sees every bird that falls out of the sky. If he knows all of that, how much more do you think he knows you? And he knows your need. He knows your heart. He knows your desires and aspirations. And and he's able to meet those needs. And so I think it's a challenging thing to stop and think about Noah in the sense that, you know, Noah was known by his enemies. He made enemies in the human sense when he got up and he will see next week that he's described as being a preacher of righteousness. And he described the righteousness that God desired in people. And he told them about the judgment that was to come. And you know there were people who didn't like that message. He was known by his enemies. But in a much more wonderful sense, he was known of God. And God tells his story here in Genesis chapter 6. And then in Hebrews, he's highlighted in that that hall of fame of the faithful. And when you go to Peter, Peter speaks about his faithfulness. Noah is mentioned time and again. And it's to the glory of God that he's known by God. And we know that God doesn't have any favorites. There's no partiality with God. There's no favoritism with God. So if God knows Noah, it's not that he says, yeah, well, uh, uh, you know, Noah, he's a good guy, but, um, you know, over here, I don't like this fella so much. I'm not going to. Well, no, God knows Noah. God knew his heart and knew his need and met those needs. God knew his three sons. He knew Noah's wife and he knew the the daughter-in-laws that uh, Noah would have. And he knows us. He knows your heart. He knows your discouragements. 
One of the hymns that I know, I'm sure we've sung it here, is No, Never Alone. And sometimes we can get that way. Sometimes we can think that we're the only ones going through something. And there may be uh, aspects that are unique to us in some ways. But truly, we're never alone. If we know Christ is our Savior, He's always with us. A few other ways to think about being known. And we kind of touched on this a little bit this morning. But when you think of Noah, what do you think of? And I understand that at the end of his life, there were, there's a, an aspect of his life whereby he made a wrong choice. And we'll get to that in, in good time. He sinned. But by and large, Noah is known for his faith in God. And I, I'm looking forward, probably next Sunday morning, we'll look at the passage in Hebrews where it discusses him as believing God about things that hadn't yet happened, things that had never happened before. There are things that we're going to face as Christians that we have never faced before. But we're not going to face something as a Christian that Christians in the last 2,000 years haven't faced. We've started going through church history in the Bible Institute. And that's one of the wonderful things about knowing just a little bit about church history is that there's nothing new under the sun. And you read their words and you say, that's what I believe because it's in the Bible. And you read their experiences and you say, that's what I've you know, I've had that thought. I've gone through that experience to some degree or another. And there's a great comfort that we can draw from that. But when you think, what is Noah known for? You're thinking of his reputation. And I think it's good for us to stop and consider in our lives to kind of take stock for a moment and think, well, what am I known for? What do I prioritize in my life? And I understand you'll be known for many things. You'll be known for different aspects of your life. You know, we, we have to have something whereby you, you go through your daily work, your vocation, and you'll be known for that. You know, when I worked in retail and grocery stores, there were certain things I was known for because that's what I did for my job. And you'll be known for that. Uh, you know, what I was known for, though, in the grocery store would sometimes change as I was given other jobs. I would move into a different department, have a different responsibility. There are parts of our lives that there's nothing we can really do about it because it's the way we look, it's the work we do, it's where we live. And we're known for those things. But where we can control our lives, what are we known for? Are we known for being a follower of Jesus Christ? And different people will have a, a part of their testimony which is predominant maybe. And some people are known for their evangelistic further, further. And some people are known for their love for the word of God. And others are known for their passionate prayer life. And others are known for some aspects of faith that's you know, unique to them. But how are we known in terms of our work for the Lord? We need to guard our hearts and guard our reputations. A verse I remember from high school, and I, I don't even remember the, the preacher who brought it up or the teacher who mentioned it, but I think it always stuck with me. In Ecclesiastes 10 verse 1, it says, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So does a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. And so the apothecary mixing together the various ingredients for medication or perfume or whatever it may be, and a few dead flies in it, it says dead flies in plural. Personally, one dead fly is sufficient to ruin something. I don't have kind of a, an upper limit where I say, okay, five flies tops, and then for me it's ruined. We knew some families from uh, South Africa when I uh, was growing up, and he had spent time in what at the time was Rhodesia before the, there was the name change and things changed over there. But he said that during a time of great need, they would buy the flour and bake the bread and there would have been flies in there, but they only really identified it when the bread was made and they just had to pick the flies out of the bread and eat the bread that remained. And so you think about that. And, and like I said, for me, one fly, like, yeah, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to look in my soup and find a fly and be like, okay, let's just scoop that little guy out and, you know, the rest of it's okay, I guess. We had England... Uh, biscuits in England, I was going to call them cookies, but they're not the biscuits. And they were kind of shortbread and they would have raisins in them and they were really good. 
And we used to call them dead fly biscuits because it looked like they were dead flies just like dotted around in the biscuit. But if I ever thought there was actually a fly there, now I know the statistic, every, you know, Oreo or whatever, there's a certain percentage of, um, you know, bug that's allowed to be in there by the FDA, and you can look it up. Um, but one is too many for me. It's just too much. And if you're squeamish, maybe don't look it up. <laughs> just, just ignore that bit. It's all good. There are no cockroaches in your cookies whatsoever. Why is it so crunchy? <laughs> my, one of my pastors in Bible college, David Moore, he preached through the 10 plagues of, uh, you know, with, with Exodus and with Moses. And he emphasized the fly plague so much that one of the young ladies in the church developed a genuine phobia of it. And for years, she really struggled with it. So I don't want to go down that road. But in Ecclesiastes, the preacher is making the point that the reputation can be ruined. In Proverbs 20 verse 11, it says, Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. And so we want to guard our hearts and guard ourselves and make sure that, again, we're not work, walking perfectly, but there's a pattern of behavior that is there. And I said this morning, and I'll say it again, that, you know, our reputations can be changed. And we can turn a corner in our life and become known for something else, and we can put things right in our past. But how much better is it if we don't have to go back and fix something? And try to undo something. Wherever you are now in your life, like I said, Noah, he's a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Do you think Noah's wife maybe wanted to say, can we have a subscript? Can we just, like a little asterisk, and let me say part of something? He wasn't a perfect man. I get that. But the record we have of him was a just man, perfect, complete, whole in, in the way that he walks with the Lord and his generations and Noah walks with God. So wherever you're at now, if it's good, then protect that. Stay walking with the Lord. Stay close to him and pursue the Lord and, and uh, keep living in such a way that your reputation is good. If you say, you know what, I don't think I'm known for the right things. And, you know, I don't know that what I emphasize in the way in my life that I get to choose to emphasize, I don't know if that's what it needs to be or should be. Well, then that can be changed. And so as we begin today with this consideration of Noah, Think about these three or four questions that we've considered. Are you known by the enemy? Are you known by God? How does God know you as a child that he's adopted or as a rebel that must be judged? Take comfort from the fact that God knows you and loves you. And then consider how we're known by others. What is our reputation? Are we known as people who will pray, who'll be compassionate, who'll give the gospel, who'll try to meet the needs of others? Are we known as a Christian? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are his generations. This is his story. He was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Let's think about how God knows us and how others know us as we go into the week ahead. Let's just close in a word of prayer, and then, Dan, if you can lead us in our closing hymn this evening. Father, I thank you, and I praise you for your goodness. I thank you, Father, for this time we've had together today just to come aside and to look into your word, to worship together. Lord, I ask that you would help us to take comfort in the fact that we're known by you. You know our hearts, our struggles, you know our discouragements. Father, I pray that we would run to you, find comfort in the fact that you do know us anyway, and there's no possibility of hiding anything or fleeing from you. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we walk close to you to be a threat to the enemy that the enemy would know us as faithful soldiers in the Lord's army. Father, may we be known outside of uh, this church as, as believers who walk with you, as people who pray, and when people have a need, they ask us to pray. And when people have a need, they ask us to help.
Father, may we have a good testimony, a good reputation in our community as being genuine followers of Jesus Christ. And may we endeavor to truly know one another, to know the needs of each other, the, uh, the, the concerns and the prayer requests. May we be willing, willing to share those things that are on our hearts, that others may be able to pray for us and help us in times of need. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for this day and we continue to look to you for your help. In Jesus' holy name I ask. Amen. Turn to hymn number 660. You would stand with me as we sing Onward Christian Soldiers. Just a note I want to make mention of that I failed to mention in the announcements. Don't forget next Sunday immediately following the morning service is a time of fellowship a little potluck meal downstairs bring something. There will always be plenty and it's a good time of food and fellowship. Okay. <laughs> Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before, Christ the royal master leads against the soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before at the sign of triumph Satan's host doth flee onward vision soldiers on to victory foundations quiver at the shout of praise brothers lift your voices loud your anthems raise onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before like a mighty army moves the church of God brothers we are treading where the saints have trod we are not divided all Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Onward then ye people join our happy throng blend with our sure voices in the triumph song glory lord and honor unto christ the king this through countless ages onward christian soldier marching as to Appreciate your attendance and your attention. Brother Ray Shada, would you please close us in prayer this day?